Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. Starting with this video, I want to talk about a few cognitive processes that are at work in bilingualism and we'll begin with the role of memory. The ideas and experiments that I'll talk about come from chapter 8 of Cojean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. So if you want to read up on the details or if you want to look up the references, go to the chapter. It's all in there. Right, so what is memory? It turns out that memory is actually not a single thing, but a range of different things. And one very basic distinction that we need to make is between short-term memory and long-term memory. Let's look at short-term memory first. It's also called working memory. And to illustrate the concept, I brought you a slide with four non-words that I would like you to remember. So you have 10 seconds. That's it, time's up. If you still remember any of these words, uh, put them in the comments below. Yeah, let's see how you did. Now, of course, four words, that's easy. Yeah, anyone can do that. Let's do something slightly more challenging. Here are eight words, 10 seconds. And that's it, time's up. Put your solutions in the comments below. Um, if you got all eight of them, uh, I have a slight suspicion that you may have cheated and I'll tell you why in a minute. Before that, I would like to show you something more. This is me playing a little game with dots lighting up. So we have sequences of dots, one, two, three, and I'm supposed to click them in the same order. Okay, three, that's easy. Now it goes to four. One, two, three, four. That's doable. One, two, three, four. Okay, one more time. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You get it, right? So you can play along. We're going to five now. One, two, three, four, five. So that's this little triangle there on top and then diagonal and back. Okay. Once more, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Okay, six. Let's try this. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, done. One, two, three, four, five, six one two three four oh no! well ah. okay so you see i failed at level six um you can google uh working memory challenge and play this for yourself see what your working memory span is um well have fun um so psychologists have been using things like these different working memory tasks to figure out how working memory works, what it is, yeah, and, and how many elements people can actually remember. And for this, they've been using non-words like slelp or flans. They've been using, and this is even crueler, I find, uh, so digit spans where people have to remember random sequences of numbers. Uh, they've been using real words like key and dog and bottle. And uh, there are also sentence repetition tasks where uh, the experimenter reads out a sentence, a longer sentence like the cow that was bitten by the dog left the farm, and then the participant has to report back that sentence uh, to the experimenter. Right. Um, now, as you will have experienced firsthand, um, working memory has only a limited capacity. This is in contrast to long-term memory, where you can remember an infinite number of things. Yeah, so human 
memory capacity is, is virtually unlimited, but working memory very much limited. You can only hold a small number of items in working memory and you can only do so for a short time, usually a few seconds, maybe up to a minute. So you can test this for yourself. How many of the non-words that you saw a minute ago do you still remember? If you do, put them in the comments. We'll talk about that. So you can view working memory sort of as the brain's post-it note. It fits only a small number of items and it's quickly lost if you don't look after it. And um, so its main purpose is, is really just to have things there for a short time so that you can inspect it. And if it's really, really important, you can commit it to long-term memory. So this is kind of the role of working memory in second language learning, for instance. So let's imagine you hear something and you notice, oh, this is something that I hear for the first time now. Uh, an exception to a grammatical rule or a new word, something like that. So working memory gives you the chance of holding this new piece of language in memory for a short amount of time, inspect it, see what's different and new and uh, interesting about it, and then keep that piece of information in long-term memory. Yeah. All right. Um, here's a picture of George Miller, famous psychologist who studied uh, working memory and who came up with this uh, sexy slogan, the magical number seven plus or minus two. So most people can hold around seven items in working memory. For me, it's, it's certainly less. Yeah. And the sad thing is that training does not significantly improve your personal baseline. So when you're playing this game with the dots that line up, you can come up with all sorts of strategies. You can see triangles and lines and crosses and whatnot and uh, chunk the sequences into these uh, patterns and that gives you better results. But your working memory span, sadly, will still be the same. Right, so that's short-term memory. Um, in this video, we won't be concerned very much with short-term memory, important though it is. So we'll focus on different aspects of long-term memory. And here on this slide, you see that long-term memory divides into two big types of memory, namely declarative or conscious memory and non-declarative or unconscious memory. Other labels for these two types are also explicit. So declarative is conscious, is explicit, and non-declarative is unconscious and implicit. Now, under declarative, uh, long-term memory. We have episodic memory, stuff that happened to you in your life and that you can remember and that you can tell other people about. So uh, what happened on Christmas Eve when you were 10 years old? Something like that. Uh, that's episodic memory. Semantic memory consists of general facts. So the, the capitals and currencies of different countries of the world, that is semantic memory. And also linguistic knowledge is here, namely knowledge of words, the meanings and pronunciations of words. That is something that is part of semantic memory. And then there is procedural memory, <clears throat> which is not part of declarative memory, but part of non-declarative memory. It's knowing how to do things. Knowing how is, in fact, another word for non-declarative unconscious memory. Um, what will be of special interest to us is actually a part of semantic memory, namely the bilingual mental lexicon. We'll come to that in just a minute. Right, so explicit, explicit memory, also called declarative memory or knowing that, concerns things that you can readily explain to other people. So your episodic memory includes things like the first names of your parents or what you did this weekend. And semantic memory includes the difference between, let's say, a dog and a cat or the you know, word pronunciations, uh, the sound of the letter E in pin. Yeah? You know what kind of vowel that is, you know how pin is pronounced as a word. <clears throat> Implicit memory is also called procedural knowledge or knowing how, and here you are not fully aware of what it is that you know. So you all can tie your shoelaces, some of you can play the guitar, you, some of you will know how ice skating works and uh, you'll all be able to tell a story so that others find it funny. This is something that you can do, but this is nothing that you can readily spell out or explain uh, what it is that you know. So that's the hallmark of procedural knowledge. You, you know how it's done, but you can't necessarily explain 
how it works. And this is what most of linguistic knowledge actually is about. So most of your linguistic knowledge is implicit. It's procedural knowledge, with the exception, as I mentioned, um, of the meanings and pronunciations of words. So you know what the meanings of triangle and carrot and heavy and talk and so on are, and you can explain them to others. But most aspects of language are procedural. So, for instance, what you say if you want to end a telephone conversation might surprise you. Yeah. So conversation analysts look at this type of behavior and um, every time I hear a uh, conversation analyst, an analysis talk, I am genuinely surprised at the patterns of behavior that they uncover. It, you wouldn't expect that. Um, also, how to pronounce a sentence that contains a list of items. In English, there's and also in other languages, there is something that we call list intonation. So just read out the sentence that we have here in the bullet point and see what your voice is doing when you're reading this out. Yeah, it's something specific and you know how it's done, you know it's how it's supposed to be done, but you wouldn't have any explicit knowledge of this. Also, you know how to make a question out of a declarative sentence such as John needs more bananas. Yeah. Does John need more bananas and why? We don't know, but what we do know is how to make a question out of a declarative clause. Right, so I promised some information about the bilingual mental lexicon, how bilinguals organize knowledge of their respective uh, languages and, and words. And uh, there's classic research on this, so um, I'll talk about three notions that have been developed by Weinreich already in the 1950s. So let's imagine we have an L1 speaker of French who knows the word pain, and this L1 speaker then uh, goes on to learn German, and lo and behold, there is a translational equivalent in German, namely the word uh, Brot. So these two words would be linked in the bilingual lexicon of our speaker through something that could be called subordinative organization. So an L2 word maps onto an L1 word and then the L1 word maps onto a given meaning. So essentially, as an L1 speaker of French, you ask, okay, what is the German word for the meaning that corresponds to pain? Yeah? So whenever you hear brot, you access the French word, which then gives you access to the meaning. That is why this is called subordinative organization. Now, as you become more proficient as an L2 speaker, um, the German word sort of takes on a life of its own and it maps onto a meaning um, without the necessity of having access to the L1 word. So L2 words and L1 words map onto the same L1 meaning in what is called compound organization. <clears throat> now, as you become even more proficient in the L2, you notice that, well, the meaning of brot actually is slightly different from the meaning of pain, even though both can refer to the same thing in uh, a given kind of circumstance. And this kind of organization would be called coordinative organization. Basically, what this means is there are two form-meaning pairs, one in each language, and these two are linked. So the forms are linked and the meanings are linked. They are coordinated. So L2 words and L1 words map onto different meanings and there can be relations between those meanings and certainly between the two forms. Right. So uh, subordinative organization, compound organization and coordinative organization sort of retrace the development from L2 beginners to L2 immediate speakers to advanced L2 speakers. But it's important to keep in mind that all three modes of organization can actually be co-present in the same speaker. So different words will be represented in different ways by the same bilingual speaker uh, so that Familiar words will be organized in the coordinative way, but um, <clears throat> there may be compound and subordinative uh, ways of organization for rare words or words that have just been encountered. So there, there's still the need to access the L1 word to understand what this new word is about. Yeah, right. Um, these uh, ideas of, of finalize have been further developed. So here 
you see um, work by Potter and colleagues who have developed um, models that they call the word association model and the concept mediation model. The word association model is essentially um, uh, the same as a Weinreich's subordinative organization, and it's something that can be found in L2 Beginners. Uh, the concept mediation model has the concepts in between that mediate between the L1 words and the L2 words, and uh, this is characteristic of speakers who speak the L2 with intermediate proficiency. <clears throat> so the idea would be that bilingual word learning starts through word association. You collect translations of words that you know. You ask things like, okay, the word for voiture, what is that in English? And people tell you it's car. Yeah, And you collect words in this way and you access the meanings of L2 words by going through the L1 and accessing the concept. But the more proficient you get, the more the L2 words become independent so that understanding the L2 uh, word <clears throat> no longer requires you to process the L1 word. So this link between L2 and L1 can actually wither and uh, disappear. It's like you're, you're speaking two languages that are more or less independent of one another. Um, this has been further elaborated and revised. So here you see the same kind of triangle between L1, L2 and concepts. Uh, this is work by Kroll and Stewart. And you see that there are arrows between the different boxes and you see that there is an asymmetry between L1 and L2. So the L1 words only weakly evoke the L2 words. That's this um, well dotted line arrow here and from the L2 to the L1 there is a stronger link and this may be a little bit puzzling at first so if you want to now you can pause this video here and think for yourself why should there be this asymmetry strong link between the L2 and the L1 but only a weak link from the L1 to the L2 okay if you want to do that pause the video now I'm going to explain why now so when you hear an L2 word Quite often you're forced to translate that back into the L1, especially when you're a beginning learner. Yeah? So this is something that you do regularly, and this uh, strengthens the lexical links between L2 words and their translational equivalents in the L1. When you use your L1, well, you're not, it's not all the time that you're forced to translate L1 words into the L2. Sometimes yes, and so there is this weak link, but most of the time you're just using your L1 and you know what the words mean. Yeah, No need to translate this into another language. And this also explains the asymmetry in the conceptual links. So there are strong conceptual links between L1 words and the concepts, but only weak conceptual links between L2 words and the concepts. And of course, as you become more proficient in the L2, these conceptual links get stronger and stronger and stronger. And if you're truly balanced uh, as a bilingual, then these conceptual links should be more or less the same. Right, so that's the revised hierarchical model of bilingual lexical knowledge. Something else that I want to present you is the distributed conceptual feature model by De Holt. Um, so what you see here are words uh, in terms of their forms and their meaning. So up there we have uh, two forms, the same word, uh, so their translational equivalents. What you can see is that they actually have the same meanings, but of course in the two different languages they have different forms. <clears throat> now some translational equivalents share all of their meaning components and some only share a subset of their meaning components. So here we have two words for chair and chair sort of means the same thing in Dutch and in English but here we have angst and fear. So German, let's say this is German angst and this is English fear and they share some semantic components but there are also semantic components that are exclusive for angst and exclusive for fear. Yeah, so some L2, L1 and L2 words share only some of their semantic features. Now, what is the empirical evidence that would motivate this kind of model? It seems plausible enough, but do we actually have evidence that would suggest that words are organized in this way? Well, uh, the Holt um, 
used a bilingual word association task. So word association means that you give people one word and have them give you a second word that they associate on the basis of the first word. Yeah? And this was done in two different conditions, namely a within language condition, where you give someone a word and ask them, okay, what word from the same language do you associate? And there was a between language condition um, where you give someone a word from language A and you tell them, okay, what word in language B uh, does this first word evoke? So to take an example, um, the within language condition would be exemplified by giving someone the word chair and asking them, okay, what other English words can you think of when you hear the word chair? And 99.999% uh, of all people would say, okay, that makes me think of table. Um, now between languages, if you give people the English word fear and you tell them, okay, what German word does that make you think of? Many will say angst. Yeah, and that would be a match because fear and angst are uh, equivalents, translational equivalents. But some might also say um, that they might offer you words like monster, which means monster. So monster doesn't mean fear, it's only semantically related, so this would be coded as a non-match. Now, if... <clears throat> uh, a pair of words <clears throat> comes up very, very often and creates many matches in this kind of task, then you actually have uh, reasons to say that, okay, those two share most of their conceptual representation. They are, uh, to all intents and purposes, translational equivalents. But um, when you have a pair such as fear and angst, uh, you will find that, well, angst is given a certain number of times, a certain proportion of times, but not all the time. So this motivates the conclusion that uh, fear and angst only share some of their conceptual representations, but not all of them. One basic conclusion of the studies that the Hoth uh, undertook was that concrete words like chair yeah, have a greater likelihood of having exact matches across languages than more abstract words such as uh, fear. Yeah? So the more complicated the meaning of a word, the less likely it is that there will be exact cross-linguistic equivalents. Okay, summing up, different models of the bilingual mental lexicon. Um, the purpose of these models is to describe how L1 and L2 words and concepts are connected in speakers' lexical knowledge. And we saw that there are difference, uh, differences across you know, different proficiency stages. So L2 beginners um, represent L2 words that link to concepts only via L1 words. So that's what we call subordinative organization. Intermediate and advanced learners also have L2 words that link directly to concepts. And L1 and L2 concepts need not be completely identical. There can be substantial differences. So French pain and German boat, um, they don't exactly mean the same thing. They can refer to the same referent, but uh, they have a much broader semantic potential than that. Okay, so let's talk about bilingual concepts a little more. Here you see three pictures of a very tasty reference. And uh, I would like you to pause this video and think for yourself what these three items would be called in English. And if you know German, also um, no, <clears throat> come up with the respective words in German. I'm going to continue now. So the first thing in English is a cake. The German word is Torte. Um, the second thing is also a cake. In German, it's a Kuchen. The third word, uh, well, the third thing here is called a pie, cherry pie. It's also a Kuchen in German. So what you see here is a slightly puzzling situation. So we have the word cake for these two, and we have the word Kuchen for these two. And this is something special in German, and this is something special in English. And what the hell is going on? Yeah. So essentially, what we're seeing is that Germans and, uh, <coughs> and, and speakers of English, they chunk up, they cut up reality into slightly different ways. So for a German, these two are the same on some level, and for a speaker of English, these two are the same 
on some level. And you, I guess you can make a case for both worldviews, if you want to call it worldviews, uh, but it's strange nonetheless. Yeah? So this phenomenon is called semantic relativity. Concepts are not the same across languages. So for, for Germans, these two here instantiate one idea, one common concept, the concept of Kuchen. And for speakers of English, these two here instantiate a common concept, the concept of cake. And um, you can imagine that when Germans try to learn the word cake, they maybe they <clears throat> encounter cake in a situation like this here, and they think, oh yeah, it's the same word in English and in German, no problem. And then they might wonder, okay, I, I wonder what you call a torta in English, because it can't be cake, but it is cake. Yeah, So that can lead to all sorts of problems. And it also can lead to situations where a German uh, L2 speaker of English would call this here a cake. Yeah, uh, They would, I don't know, come to visit and say, oh, that cake looks nice. I want to have a piece. Um, and um, you only have pie to give them. Yeah, That would be strange. So when learners use L2 words with L1 concepts, that's what you call a semantic accent. Yeah? So someone calls this thing a, a, a cake, but it's really a pie. Well, you can understand what it is that they want, but it's still a little strange. Yeah, That's a semantic accent. Um, now, this brings us back to a study that I already discussed in the last video, namely the naming and confidence task that Pavlenko and Malt conducted with Russian learners of English. So they had them name different household items, glasses, cups, and mugs, and so on and so forth. And what we saw is that um, there are differences between uh, early bilinguals, childhood bilinguals, and late bilinguals. So that uh, the late bilinguals are more in line with native Russians when they name these things, and the early bilinguals are actually influenced by the English semantic categories that they have learned. Yeah? So early bilinguals are more likely uh, to call this thing here a stakan when in fact the native Russians and the late bilinguals and even the childhood bilinguals call it a bokal. Yeah? All right. Um, again, here the, the correlation measures the <clears throat> uh, late bilinguals. They correlate very well in their naming choices with the native Russians. The early bilinguals, not so much. Yeah? Right, here's another study that is uh, like this. So here, Malton Sloman. Uh, investigated L2 learners of English with different L1s and they had them judge um, different uh, types of containers. So what they asked is, on a scale from 1 to 7, how typical is this object for categories such as bottle, jar, or container? Yeah? So you see that these are not very typical bottles. So th this, I would say, that's a good jar, yeah? something that you can put jam in or, I don't know, honey or pickles, something like that. Yeah? <clears throat> uh, bottle, is this a good bottle? I mean, this gallon milk container thingy. Um, it's not a great bottle, if you ask me. This might be a better bottle, but still, it's so tiny and... Uh, so the question is, how do L2 learner ratings compare to those of native speakers when you ask them, okay, is this a bottle, is this a jar, is this a container? Uh, here are the results. Again, you see correlation measures when they're close to one, that means that, okay, these groups are doing the same thing. When they're not so close to one, it means that, well, these groups are certainly doing different things. So. Uh, what you see here with regard to bottles and jars is that the more experienced um, L2 learners, they were quite similar to the ratings of uh, native speakers. Yeah? So <clears throat> uh, the, the least experienced learners, they have only a weak correlation with the native speakers with regard to bottle. Um, and as we get more experienced, the better the correlation becomes so native, that means bilinguals who are native in both languages and how they compare to monolingual native speakers. Um, with regard to jars, well, we get much nicer correlations, in fact. But with regard to containers, so even the native speakers don't really agree um, 
with the monolingual English speakers. So containers, that is kind of a garbage can category. Um, that is not very picturable. So the results here are not very conclusive. Right. So a last topic for this video that I want to bring up is bilingual autobiographical memory. Are your memories encoded in one of your languages? When you think back um, to time you spent in a different place, do the sounds of a different language come up in your mind? So there is a principle that has been uh, expressed by the name of the encoding, encoding specificity principle. So an event can only be recalled successfully if the information contained by the retrieval cue, the thing that you're given as a stimulus, is encoded in the memory trace of the event. That means something can remind you of an episode in your life when that something is part of how you remember that episode and language can be such a part. So the prediction of the encoding uh, specificity principle would be that when bilinguals are cued with the same word in different languages, they might come up with different memories. So here's a study that was done on Spanish-English bilinguals. Again, in the United States, subjects had immigrated to the US and had lived there for a long time, and they were given a word prompt task. So they were given a list of words, and they had to come up with a specific memory for each word, uh, write down what happened, when it happened, and so on and so forth. So on the first day of the experiment, they were given a bunch of English words like horse, boat, scratch, salty, and surprise. And uh, on day two, the same kind of exercise, except this time the words were in Spanish. And uh, the researchers then coded the stories that they got in terms of congruent memory episodes and crossover memory episodes. Congruent, uh, congruent memory episodes were episodes in which the language of the cue, English on day one, corresponded to the language that was spoken at the time of experience. Yeah? So if you saw a Spanish word, and that would uh, remind you of something that you um, experienced as a child when everyone around you was speaking Spanish. That would be coded as a congruent memory experience. And uh, Scratch, for instance, if you've only experienced English during recent times and Scratch brings up a recent memory, that also would be coded as a congruent memory episode. By contrast, crossover memory episodes uh, would be all episodes where the language of the cue does not correspond to the language that was spoken at the time of experience. Okay, what came out? Well, it turned out that most memories actually included language. So people reported that they could hear voices or formed association with particular words, uh, stuff that uh, people said. Yeah, And on both days, um, more congruent memories than crossover memories were registered. So it seems that um, language actually plays a role, that there is something to the encoding specificity hypo, uh, principle. However, um, the Spanish cues did not always trigger older memories, and this may have been because the bilinguals continued to use Spanish alongside English when in the US. However, with regard to the English, um, English cues um, provoked more recent memories that were associated with English language stimuli. All right, summing up for today, uh, we saw that there are different types of memory. Memory is not one single thing, but rather several different types. Uh, the most important distinction is between short-term memory and long-term memory, and long-term memory divides up into declarative, um, conscious, explicit memory and non-declarative, unconscious, implicit memory, also knowing that and knowing how. Right, we saw three different ways of organizing bilingual lexical knowledge, subordinative, compound, and coordinative. These largely map onto different degrees of proficiency, but they can be co-present in the same speaker as well. We also touched on semantic relativity, so concepts are not the same across languages. And we talked about the encoding specificity principle, so an event can be recalled successfully if the information contained by the retrieval queue is encoded in the memory trace of that event. All right, that's it for today. Au revoir. See you then.